Bibles with me to Psalm 103, please. And if you're already there, let's put a marker there because we'll be coming back to that and move over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to God's people over in the coffee house. There's a wonderful ministry going on over there that the youth run. If you're looking for a hot chocolate or a hot beverage after church, that is the place to go. God's peeps are over there, so God bless them. There was a little boy who was in his Sunday school class. He was about four or five years old. And the teacher was, was teaching in Genesis in the beginning. And he was fascinated how God created man. And then, as the teacher began to speak about removing that rib from Adam's side to create a woman, he was just enthralled. And after Sunday school, he told his mom all about it, and she was so happy for him that, that he was just into the message and into the teaching. And a couple days went by, and he, and he started to develop a stomach ache. And he, and he held his side, and she said, Oh, are you okay? He said, Oh, I'm hurting. She said, do you have a stomach ache? And he said, no, I think I'm having a wife. <laughs> In chapter five of 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about this body that we have. But I'm so thankful that here at Calvary Chapel, we go through the whole word and in order to get the full context of chapter five, we need to back up a little bit into chapter four. Paul talks about the things that are seen and that are not seen. And if you want to jump up a little bit with me to verse 15, he says, For all things are for your sakes, that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. I have that underlined in my Bible. For all things are for your sakes. You know, keep in mind as we enter a new year that that's what Jesus is about. That is what God is about. For everything is done for our sakes. Therefore, we do not lose heart, verse 16, but though the outer man is decaying, and women, that applies to you as well, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Every time I read that, I just blow a fuse in my mind. I, I can't comprehend that. I ask <laughs> God is just to teach me because how can you see things that aren't seen? Did you pick that up there? As we sang earlier that God would open the eyes of our hearts, that's how we see those things that are not seen. He goes on in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, For we know that if this earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house made not with hands, eternal in the heavens. So he makes a comparison of our earthly body to that of a tent. If you're a camper or a backpacker, if you know anything about a tent, they're not made for living permanently in. 
as our bodies aren't. They're not designed or they weren't created to live in this day and age for 70, 80, 90, 100 years. If you'll flip over with me to Psalm 103, this is a psalm of thanksgiving. Let's pick up in verse 11, right in the middle there where the psalmist says, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame or our tent. He is mindful that we are but dust. As for man or woman, their days are like the grass. As the flower of the field, so does it flourish. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more. And its place is acknowledged no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and are remembered his precepts and do them. So God knows that we're just in this, this tent, this temporal place. If you recall, Jesus said, I have prepared a place to you, for you. For in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. We are in the habit of seeing. You may have heard this, seeing is believing. We're in the habit of touching. We're in the habit of wanting to know and seeing with our eyes, not with our hearts. When my wife and I were first married, I don't know how it happened, but somehow we ended up with a child. And while she was pregnant, there were two little boys of friends of ours that were involved in our lives, and I'll never forget their names because it was the first time I was in contact with little boys that just were into everything. Simon and Jeffrey. Some of you may remember those little lads. But Michelle was pregnant. And she was walking like this. And the little boy, Simon, laughed at her and said, he's fat. And my wife said, I am not fat. I'm with child. And they were stunned. Child, what? what? And she said, there's a baby in there. And they both immediately ran over and grabbed her blouse and were pulling it up. <laughs> we want to see. We want to see. The same is for us. We want to see. I know I do. I often think about it. I want to see that house. I want to see what is my heavenly body going to be like. But we don't know that. Paul goes on in verse 2 to say, For indeed, this house, in this house, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. If you listen real closely, can you hear it? Can you hear your body groaning? I know I did this morning when I woke up. And as much as we are having put it on, we shall not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but want to be clothed in order that what is mortal shall be swallowed up by life. Verse 5, now he who has prepared for us this very purpose is God, who gave us a spirit as a pledge. Jesus said when he, when he left this earth, he said, I won't leave you alone, I'll leave you with the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And God, if you will, has left that as a pledge, a down payment, knowing that he shall return one day, and that we have this down payment to know that we are going to have this heavenly body, this heavenly place, when we leave this world, when this tent is put down for the last time. Verse 6, therefore being always of good, good courage and knowing that while we were at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. There it is. As I had said earlier in verse 18, how can we see things that are unseen? Paul tells us here it's by faith. I believe it was Billy Graham that said, people ask him, 
You've not seen God. How do you know he exists? And he equated that to the wind. You haven't seen the wind, have you? But you see it blow through the trees. You see the leaves move. You see the effects of the wind. Haven't we all seen the effects of Lord Jesus in our lives? The miracles, the things that he's done. Once we become born again, we become that new creation. We begin to see the good things that he has done in our lives. I know that, that I have over the years. He says in verse 8 that we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. As I get older, I have gone to more and more funerals. And in some instances, it's, it's wonderful. You know the person is a believer and that, that they're at peace. The groaning is over. The tent is put away. They are in their new heavenly dwelling and we can all just rejoice and praise the Lord for that. But I was at a funeral some years ago of a dear relative and the guy that was given his eulogy um, mentioned that he was really good at detailing cars. And that he had this gift of just taking a car and just making it new, and, and he did. And he said in his, in his eulogy that that's why Santa called him home, that he's up there right now waxing his sleigh. And I thought to myself, God help us, because if I come to heaven and the first person I meet is Santa, <laughs> I'm gonna begin to wonder if I'm in the right place. If Santa hands me a can of turtle wax, I'll know. <laughs> In verse 9, he says, Therefore, also we have our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. That is what we are called to as, as Christians. It's, it's pretty, pretty simple when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it. Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. Not a few things, not a couple of things, but all things. And once you get that in perspective in your life and you follow him, it's easy to be pleasing to him. When I had, first became a Christian, I had many friends come up to me and say, bummer for you, dude. You can't do this, that, or the other thing anymore. And I remember saying, thank God. <laughs> I'm saved from that. But you know, we have such freedom in Christ that we, we, we can do those things, yet Paul reminds us that those things may not be lawful, but they're not profitable as well. And that's what we've been saved from. He goes on verse, in verse 10 to say, for we must all appear before him that is the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may be recompensed for his or her deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now this judgment seat of Christ is not to be confused with the great white throne of God, where the unbelievers will be judged. I know for some of us it's hard to understand that word judge don't judge me. I remember saying that as a new Christian. Don't judge me. You're judging me. In this instance, this is for the believer. It's the, the judgment seat of Christ or the bema seat of Christ, which we are going to be judged for the things that we did or didn't do for the Lord, good or bad. The important thing to note here is that God is not looking at the things that we did or that we didn't do for him. But what are the motives of our heart while we do them? When Bruce asked me to do this, to come up here and fill in for him a couple weeks ago, I immediately wanted to buy a ticket to Tarshish. I am not going to Nineveh. <laughs> <laughs> and with fear and trembling, and I prayed about it and got back to Bruce and I said that, that I would do it. And I questioned myself, what were my motives? 
My motives was to be up here just to share the simplicity of the Lord Jesus Christ with you, to open his word and just to share it openly. God's not keeping a tally of what we didn't or what we didn't do for him or what we did wrong, but when it's from our hearts, the motives that we have towards him, that's where the blessing comes from. Whether you fail or whether you fall, just keep walking with the Lord. Many people will come on that day, Jesus says, and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Great miracles, cast out demons. Didn't we do these great things? Look how many people I, I saved for you, Lord. This is harsh. Jesus replied, said, depart from me, for I never knew you. Translation to me is, is that your heart was never in the right place. You did it for yourself. Verse 11, therefore knowing the fear of the Lord, we, pers we, we persuade men and women, but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also to your consciousness. If you remember, as we read Psalm 103, the word fear is in there many times. To fear the Lord. When I first became a Christian, I struggled with that. I thought Jesus was loving. I don't want to fear him. But as I read the scriptures more and more, I found out that that fear, as we read in Psalm 103, is the fear as like a father has compassion on his children. Did you catch that when we read that? A father or a mother who means what they say and say what they mean is a loving mother and father. Don't take cookies out of the cookie jar, Frankie, or you'll get a spanking. Really? Let me put my hand in there. Boom. Discipline. That's a loving mother or father. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, Peter reminds us that God doesn't want any to perish, but he wants all to come to repentance. Because, see, the fear is that we'll be separated from God for all of eternity. Those things that we talked about in the previous verses that are eternal that we can't see, to be separated from him for all of eternity. That is the fear that they're speaking of here. Because God is a just God. Verse 12, we are again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us that you may have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and in heart, and not in heart. Those that were in Corinth were coming against Paul and his ministry. They were questioning whether he was even a disciple who ordained him. He's just a self-made disciple. And they were coming with all these grandiose Bible studies and stories and trying to put Paul down so they could take what that was given him to him. And Paul is saying there that, you know, be prepared for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. Verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. They were saying that Paul was beside himself. You know what that means, right? That he's crazy. Why are you speaking? I don't know. I wanted to speak. Well, why, why can't I speak? You know, there's two of them. He's beside himself. And Paul's saying there that if we were beside ourselves, it was for God. But if we are a sound mind, it is for you. Verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all have died. And he, he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for the, and rose again on their behalf. You see, Jesus didn't die just for the elect few. He died for all. I underline that in my Bible. No longer live for ourselves. If you're looking for a New Year's resolution as we come into 2019, that is a good place to start. You see, because we have a propensity just to live for ourselves. 
In Christianese, we call it what? The flesh. It's this thing that wakes up with us every morning. I'm hungry, feed me. Get the hell away. Ooh, that coffee smells good. I want a cup, move. But Jesus died and rose again that we would also have eternal life, but we would no longer live for ourselves or live in the flesh. And he rose again at the end of verse 15. He says there, on what? For who? On our behalf. Verse 16, therefore from now on we recognize no man according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. It says in God's word that we're called to take up our crosses daily. Every single day. To keep that flesh in check. To keep that walk going on with the Lord. In verse 17 he says, Therefore if any man or woman is in Christ, they are a new creature. The old things have passed away. (coughs) Excuse me, behold the new things have come. The newness, new things have come. The old things have passed away. The ultimate in a gift from God. Well, how do the old things pass away, you may be asking. It's just as simple as asking Christ into your heart. Being that new crate, that new creature and allowing him to come inside and work in, in you and the old things pass away Behold, the new things have come. When I first became a Christian, I learned very quickly that new things come on a daily basis. When Michelle and I had our first child, then we had a second child, we had a third child. Each one of them were different. Each one of them were new. We had a fourth child, another new one. Such a blessing from God, but I learned that I didn't know everything. I had a lot to learn. I grew up being an an avid snow skier. Love going to the mountains. Love being in the snow. But that's just not conducive with a newborn. So I just left Michelle home with the children and skied. No, I'm joking. (laughs) So we decided that we wanted our children to learn this sport. Have you ever tried to put a glove on a toddler? It's like trying to put socks on a rooster. They're fighting you and their fingers are wiggly and you you just put your hand into your glove and you think, why can't you get your fingers in there? So I would become impatient. I would just stick their fingers on and my children would go, look it. Daddy put my gloves on. They're walking around like Spock, live long and prospo. God was teaching me that I needed to learn some patience. So my wife looked around and discovered that all the other toddlers didn't have gloves on. They had mittens on. Aha, something new. Now we just had to get the thumb in. Even then, I couldn't get the thumb. It was like a a wiggly worm. I would say, is your thumb in there? "Uh Uh-huh. Look it. I have no thumbs. And I would ask them, I would say, what happened? I don't know. It it just popped out. Well, put it back in, I want to (laughs) ski. And then my wife discovered the ultimate, the ultimate new thing. Somebody had invented a mitten that zipped all the way open and you could put the hand in and place the thumb in there and zip it closed. Hallelujah, (laughs) amen. I don't say those things just to make you laugh. I really struggled with it, really. But I say those things because sometimes We're looking for something new in our lives. We're looking for something big, something grandiose, something exciting. And we miss the little things that God is pointing out to us. 
the tiniest of things that he wants to bless us with. We're so busy with moving through life, propping the tent up as it's falling down and putting another stake in that we miss those little things, those new things that God has for us. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, if you read the book of Lamentations, it's horrible. So much destruction. But what does the author say there? He says that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are what? They are old and stale every morning. No. They are new every morning. Not once a week. Not twice a week. Every morning. We as Christians get to partake in that. His newness, I equate it to just freshly baked muffins or cinnamon rolls that are coming out of the oven. Have you ever had like a cup of coffee with a freshly baked cinnamon roll? <gasps> oh, they're to die for. And that's the way his mercies and his love are given to us every morning. No stale stuff. No stale mercies. You know, I work with a lot of fellas, and I'll ask them, hey, how's your day going? Same old stuff, different day. Really? Yeah, what's new with you? I remember when someone first shared the love of Christ with me. I said to them, what are you smoking? <laughs> How can that be for real? I'm not a sinner. I'm a good person. It wasn't until I met the Lord face to face that I realized he was right. And I was wrong. As we spoke of earlier, those things that are unseen, that now that we can see, do you remember Thomas? Forever to be the doubting Thomas. You know that story where he, Jesus came and revealed himself to the disciples, but Thomas was at the Starbucks getting a cinnamon roll and a coffee <laughs> because they were new every morning. And he missed it. And he came back and the disciples told him that Jesus appeared and he said, I won't believe it until I can see the wounds on his hands and his feet, until I can reach in to his side and, and put my fingers where the spear went. <gasps> he doubted. But you know the miracle of that is not that he doubted, it's that Jesus met him right where he was at. Jesus came to him and said, look, See, reach here. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That's the Jesus experience, isn't it? He will meet each and every person on this whole entire planet right where they're at. He has you here. He has me here. He has us right where we're at because he loves us. The new year is upon us. How many of you make, you don't have to show hands, but make New Year's resolutions? I've done it. Did you know that the sale of gym equipment rises this time of year? Gym memberships rise this time of year. Dietary books on diets and recipes. The sales increase this time of year. Because people know, who know that are in marketing know that a lot of us want something new. So I went to Good Housekeeping. Hey, my mom was a fan of the magazine. 
And I wanted to see if they had any New Year's resolutions, something that I could glean off of. Well, I'll tell you, there wasn't much there, there, but they had 36 New Year's resolutions. So I jotted down the top 10. You ready? This is the one that's going to change my life. Number one on their list of 36. Add more citrus to your grocery cart. If only I had known. <laughs> Number two, eat more vegetables regularly. That, that's not too bad. Number three, book all your doctor visits for the whole year at one time. Here's a good one. Number four, outsmart your belly bloat. I don't know how you do that, but... <laughs> Number five, don't share your New Year's resolution on social media. Yeah, because if you put, I bought citrus in my cart, everybody may unfriend you. <laughs> Number six, be a plant owner. I say if you buy a house plant and take it home with you, that you'll feel better about yourself. What happens if the plant dies? <laughs> Moving forward, number seven, do one thing at a time. Stop multitasking because it will drive you crazy. I tend to agree with that one. Make your home more fragrant is number eight, some aromatherapy. Number nine, master the stairs, get more exercise. I kind of like that. Number 10, decorate your house with family pictures. I kind of like that too. And I had to throw number 11 in there because they say to sanitize your smartphone phone weekly. That's going to be my New Year's resolution. <laughs> no, Christians, I think our New Year's resolution is knowing that we are a new creation in Christ. We tend to forget those things, don't we? Life is hard. Jesus told us that we were going to have trials and tribulations in this world. That it was going to be hard. But I love what he said. He said, but be of good cheer. Because it's going to be tough, kid. No, he said, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Remember, as I, as I opened the Bible and we read together that all these things that have have been done for our sakes. Let's read verse 17 again. Therefore, if any man or woman is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, <clears throat> new things have come. All these new things that God has for us in this New Year's, that's my resolution. As we sang earlier, that he would open the eyes of our hearts, that we would see him more and more and that we would draw closer to him. As we go on and read verse 18, now all things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ <coughs> and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You see, there's a separation from God that started in the garden with Adam and Eve. Sin, it's pretty simple. But the good news is, is that God wants us to reconcile to him. If you've been struggling this last year, and you're just looking forward to the new year, I encourage you, be reconciled to God. Call out on his name. Seek him. Ask him for help. It is so simple. And yet, in that quiet place, he'll meet you there. He'll meet you right where you're at. Paul goes on to tell us that Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were entering <clears throat> through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ. Thank you so much, Jim. 
be reconciled to God. What does that mean to you to be reconciled to God? You ever have a fight with your wife or your spouse or your husband? None of you? Am I the only one, Lord? All right, I must leave now. Everyone was just looking, not me. When you have that separation of what God intended you to have, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to come back. Why is it so hard? It's the original sin, pride. It's that flesh. I was right and she was wrong. <laughs> come to find out I'm wrong more often than not. You know how I know that? Michelle tells me. <laughs> I'm just joking. But when you're wrong, you're wrong. God doesn't point a finger at us and tell us that we're wrong, you awful, wicked sinner. Some may, but not Jesus. He says, come unto me, all that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. You see, man and women, are, we're created basically, as Paul's teaching us here, we're, we're a spirit. Yes, we have this tent, we have this body that's decaying, but yet as the inner man is being renewed or inner woman is being renewed day by day, there's a spiritual connection. God hasn't severed that connection. We do. That's why Paul is saying here, I beg you, be reconciled to God. That's pretty heavy. Verse 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is a miracle. All of the world's sin cast upon Jesus. What was that like for him to bear that upon the cross? And for what reason? Well, as we started this study, we know for us. His love for us is never ceasing. It is so big that when I think about it and when I read his word, I can't comprehend it. But God tells us that we were never supposed to comprehend it. We were just supposed to enter in, right? We were supposed to just come in. You know, this whole thing of being judged for the things that we haven't done or done I want to get to heaven and be one of those dudes that say, when, Lord? When did I do anything for you? I just sat on the couch and watched the Rams play and ate a pizza. I mean, what? when did I? He's not keeping score. He's not keeping track. As long as our heart is in the right place, and Paul is telling us, be reconciled to God. And it even gets better because... We are now ambassadors for Christ. In verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ as though God was entering through us. Guess who the ambassadors are? That's you and I. I'm called to share the love of God with others. No trips. You ever have someone share the love of Christ with you with a total trip I mean I was saved but maybe a week and this Christian guy came up to me and just was rejoicing that I was saved and we were having fellowship until he asked me that he couldn't pay his rent and what I might covering his rent for him for the month that's a trip man and I told him what I can't pay your rent 
Here it comes. You're a Christian, aren't you? No guilt trips. Only to preach the word of God, Jesus, and Jesus only. That's the beauty of this reconciliation. That's the beauty of this righteousness that we have in us. If you'll jump with me over just into chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the surpassing greatness and the power may be of God and not for ourselves. Did you catch that? We are the earthen vessels. We are the clay pots. It was also Billy Graham that said that, yeah, I do have this treasure inside me. I am an earthen vessel, but I leak. Jesus took care of that one too, didn't he? We get to be filled on a continuous basis. Our cups do overflow. If we'll just look at it. My wife and I constantly have this discussion about is the cup half full or is the cup half empty? I think that's why God brought us together because we know that our cup is always full. It's always overflowing, no matter where we're at, no matter what we're doing, no matter what comes into our lives. He's always there filling and guiding. As we close here, I want to leave you with one scripture. It's in Colossians chapter 3. It's Paul again. He says, If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Did you catch that? It's the unseen again, isn't it? We're not to set our minds on the things of this earth, but we're to set our minds on the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I love that. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for saving us. And not only that, Lord, but just for continually calling, calling out to us for that reconciliation. Those things, Lord, that, that we may do, but the enemy may come in and say you're separated from God. May it never be. For there is no separation for those who are in you, Lord. Father, as we leave here today and we walk out into this world, Help us to keep our minds on you. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they Great is thy 
Thine own dear presence to cheer. 